Hey, it's Joe. Before we get started, make sure to subscribe down below by clicking the subscribe button and hit the bell to get notified every time I release a new video on Automation Awesomeness. 20 years ago, maybe uh, a very small portion of people uh, depended heavily on in runtime on other companies. And today, it's very, very rare to see a software package that is an isolated island on its own and doesn't work with anything on the internet. And, and as soon as we're using services on the internet, um, we start depending a lot on changes that other companies might do without our involvement at all. So the testing pyramid were amazing for an age where everything is under your control. In an age where uh, major components of risk happen after deployment and happen without any influence or control from the people working on a specific piece of software, we need to be able to de-risk these things much more effectively. And this is where um, testing small isolated unit of, units of code and focusing on speed of isolated testing doesn't really bring as much benefits because these things only happen when it's highly integrated and deployed in production. Uh, all, all the good practices we had looking at deterministic stuff, they, they're still there. It's just that there's some new types of risks and additional types of risks. And I think one of the things that's really interesting for me is to see how these um, trends of, of observability in, and testing in production are kind of meeting with traditional testing techniques and how people that are uh, in a quality um, role is it what but th these these things kind of start really merging and lots of interesting overlapping concepts uh, start appearing between the whole site reliability engineering and um, testability and observability and I think that's a very interesting space. We'll see lots of practices um, kind of cross-pollinating these, these um, communities. And I think, um, you know, looking at production risks and looking at observability risks, there's a whole, you know, industry emerging there. But then now we have, uh, from that segment of the industry, um, concepts like um, the reliability kind of budget and... and um, how long your system can go down and what kind of risks you can take, what kind of risks you must de-risk. And I think that will start informing how we do software testing and it's already informing how we do software testing uh, in a different way. And software in production is a reality for many teams today and it's actually um, done right, quite a liberating way of uh, not having to spend a lot of time looking for some stuff that, you know, you can't even de-risk before going to production. For example, the whole idea of canary deployments that is coming from, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, kind of chaos engineering and things like that is, well, you know, launch two versions of your app and give 5% of your users access to one version, 95% to the other. Watch if some really weird crap is happening. And if not, keep increasing that percentage. This allows you to catch things that you were not even able to catch before deployment because you don't get real user traffic. So um, I myself have, have several times fallen into this trap where we build wonderful, wonderful tests, but then those tests are kind of like cement. They, they are so hard to change that they are preventing us from changing the code. And there's lots of ways people fall into this trap, usually when they are uh, trying to test something really complex and don't think about decoupling or, or remodeling it. Sometimes it's because uh, the APIs are such that you can't kind of easily test something. And we build these frameworks that um, help us de-risk the software, but slow down how quickly we can change the software in a horribly uh, mistaken uh, case of priorities. I have remember a team I worked with where they had something like 7,000 tests on, you know, testing the user interface. And then when they wanted to change uh, a couple of things in the website design that broke 
half of those tests because they were all very, very tightly coupled to DOM paths and, and identifiers and things like that. And at this point, you know, you really have this um, conflict between maintaining the test suite and improving the software. And, and really, there should not, not be that kind of conflict because if there is, the test suite will always lose. And people will disable failed tests and, and forget to update them and, and delete them. So we need to design automated tests in particular so that they can be changed easily and that uh, they don't slow down the development. If they start slowing down development, then they're going to lose. Approval testing is a relatively unknown testing technique. I think people should know about that more. But uh, basically, approval testing is a way of automating the tests where um, the test automation system doesn't know if the difference in test results is good or bad. But it knows how to measure the difference between an old baseline and what the system does now and to present the difference to humans who can make a decision very quickly. And with approval testing... Uh, if the change was good, then a human can just say, I approve, and the new state becomes the baseline for the next test. And approval testing is incredibly useful for situations where it's difficult to describe an expectation up front, but you kind of know if it's good or bad once you see it. And it's also good to catch these unknowns that pe people can't even predict. Traditional unit testing, for example, um, or kind of automation based on, on um, fixed expectations is looking more for expected outcomes. And if it's not looking for something specific, it will not notice it. And um, approval testing helps you spot if something else is there, something you might have not been expecting. And so the visual stuff is really something where the machines are not that good at telling you if the outcome is okay or not, but they're really, really good at saying there's a difference here. I don't know if this dif this difference is what you wanted or not, but here's a difference. And this is where um, instead of these really difficult, hard-coded tests, we moved to basically automating 99% of, of the testing process, leaving 1% that really required human opinion for the humans. And we realized that every time we have a, a major change we want to do that breaks a lot of these kind of expected tests, what we end up doing is we run some example documents through exporters, through kind of the, the, the visual rendering, and then we look at them and say, well, you know, this is good or bad. And we decided, let's, let's just automate that part. We might not be able to automate it entirely, but let's automate the part we can to optimize our time. So this is where kind of this tool called Appraise um, got started and it's now open source. People can download it from appraise.qa. It basically sets up an, a, a, a fixture like uh, expected tests, uh, like usual kind of um, frameworks for, for tests based on expectations, spec by example, or kind of unit testing. It runs up a website or, or kind of takes an image of a, a app in action, depending how you configure it, and then it compares that to the baseline image. And if there's a difference, it just kind of highlights the differences for a human to approve. And by uh, moving from kind of the, the model of we have to specify everything up front to, hey, let the machine look for unexpected stuff and show it to us, we've been able to replace thousands and thousands of horrible tests with probably hundreds of um, visual tests that are much, much easier to maintain and give us a lot more value. We really should automate to assist people, not to, to not to replace them. You know, stuff that can be replaced, or if a machine can do what I do, it absolutely should do it.